Today we are going to explore a study by a friend of mine and it is called Burden of Proof, a comprehensive review of the feasibility of 100% renewable electric systems. It has become very popular to advocate for a world that is powered by the sun and by the wind. Millions upon millions of people believe that we can save the world and the biosphere if only we build enough wind turbines and solar panels. Bear in mind, even a professor from the third ranking university in the world can produce work riddled with errors. And that's why Ben Hurd, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of Adelaide, has written this study with the help of a few notable scientists with expertise relevant to the subject of the paper. Now this in itself says nothing about the quality of the paper itself. And I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to check this paper out for yourself. The purpose of this video is to show you how I, as a non-scientist, can retest one of the determining factors with relative ease. Here we see figure one from the burden of proof study. It shows us a couple of models that try to predict future energy demand in exajoules, as you can see on the vertical axis. I don't see many strange things. The RCP 2.6 scenario, which ends somewhere around 700 exajoules per year, is the most optimistic model you can get from the IPCC. The green and blue stripes, however, should catch your attention. These are the two that I am going to single out, just to show you how dangerous they can be. They're only models. How can models be dangerous? They are used as propaganda tools to influence the general public and to seed the erroneous notion that we can save the world with renewables alone. First look at the curvature and the way they veer off the median. This is a red flag. They contradict the preponderance of evidence, in this case the preponderance of the models. The bigger the difference, the higher the probability becomes of these feasibility studies not providing an accurate model with predictive capabilities. Next, I am going to look at the difference between OECD and non-OECD energy demand. First, we take a look at the OECD and find out that there are about 1.3 billion people in OECD countries. Just so you know, the OECD can be seen as the traditional West, with a couple of exceptions. But it is fairly accurate and it helps us to get some basic ballpark figures. After studying all the tables, we find out that OECD population growth is about 8 million people per year. And that non-OECD growth is 10 times that number, 80 million people per year. Now we are going to reproduce a couple of graphs and check out some existing ones. First you see my reproduction. World population growth seems to be quite linear onwards toward 2050. You can see a telling discrepancy between OECD and non-OECD countries. Next we see a different graph in which one line stands out and those are the African grow models. We have to keep a keen eye on these models because we will be able to derive some conclusions after we're done analyzing these figures, albeit superficially and tentatively. Here we see the two populations in a graph and that gives us a sense of volume. It's not accurate, but it serves a purpose. The United States Energy Information Administration forecasts that most energy consumption growth will come from non-OECD countries, which seems reasonable given the fact that they experience the highest growth in population and therefore primary needs like water and food. But there is something different going on in this graph, upon which we will touch later on. Now I have added energy to the diagram with proportionality in mind you can see a clear inverse relationship between population and energy in the OECD and non-OECD countries. Now we can deduce how much energy is required per person. The OECD person uses about 55,000 kilowatt hours per year. Some might think that this is a strange figure given the fact that their electricity bill says something differently. Here we see total energy consumption per capita. 
This comprises everything from how much we invest in our food, water and drinks to the energy which is needed to make your TV, the energy which is required for services like your phone, but also for government and a great host of other things. Everything we do is possible thanks to the energy we have available to us. Now we see the same graph, but in terms of total energy consumption. This is what the graph will look like if we maintain the status quo and stop augmenting non-OECD energy availability per capita, which is an extremely worrying prospect. Do note that when I reproduced these figures and made this graph, my blood turned cold, because this graph is a function of population growth per capita energy consumption as projected by the Energy Information Administration. It suggests that non-OECD people are not going to increase their energy prosperity. And this leaves us with the worrying prospect of enduring instability. Suppose we can augment non-OECD per capita energy consumption and start gradually doubling from 2020 until 2030, we would see an explosion in energy demand, which is not bad, but it poses a lot of problems. It will make deep decarbonization even more challenging. And do note that many of the emerging economies are trying to do exactly this. They want to increase their energy prosperity as it will boost GDP and everything else. We should be helping these countries as well as we can. But this contradicts the notion that we can do with less. Now we are going to expose a fundamental flaw which is blatantly being ignored by the 100% renewable crowd. Even the Energy Information Administration doesn't make a secret of this. Africa remains one of the troubled places in the world. Energy demand and consumption is not going up fast enough to make a true difference on the African continent, which is plagued by instability as a result of low energy prosperity. One of the issues which is closely tied to low energy prosperity is high fertility rate. It might seem counterintuitive, but it is very logical when you think about it. In any case, we see a correlation between non-OECD slash high fertility regions and low energy prosperity. Let's take it one step further. Low energy countries are also those who are most prone to suffer from the effects of droughts and famine. Sometimes not even in their own country, but simply because they are too poor and get passed over by richer countries that can pay more for food. Water and food shortages are said to be one of the causal factors leading up to the Arab Spring and the ensuing civil war in Syria. What would you do when instability came knocking on your door? Sometimes I wonder whether this is a non sequitur or not, but I am going to go this route anyway. It is my contention that energy means that you are safe because there is enough water and food as a consequence of having plenty of energy. Having plenty of energy means that you can lead a prosperous life. However, many people don't share in this energy prosperity. And this has to change because maintaining the status quo is morally reprehensible. Back to the graph where it all began. Let's consider the Greenpeace Revolution study. What does it have to say about the energy prosperity the Africans are going to get or not? This Greenpeace study is pretty brutal by assuming that we can make do with 15% less than we use today. How are the African people, for instance, to develop further if they cannot have more energy per capita? Because that's the crux, isn't it? Not just more energy overall, it is higher energy prosperity per capita that is required to further develop Africa into a modern continent of peace and prosperity. It seems that Greenpeace is not at all interested in helping our African counterparts. They want to allow only for marginal growth in overall energy available for Africa, whereas the population grows unmitigated. The reference case allowed for the average African to have 10% of what an OECD person has to its disposal. But Greenpeace 
almost halves that. Now, this is as immoral as it gets. We simply put a glass ceiling over Africa and tell all those people that they can go to hell with their aspirations to become more industrious, more wise, and more prosperous overall. And as we continue, we stumble across the World Wildlife Fund Ecofish study, which is a parody compared to Greenpeace's quasi-scientific paper. And that's bad. They want to degrow the entirety of the human species. They are staunch advocates for biomass, but they seem to forget that biomass comes at the loss of habitat for endangered species. You can't have them both. We have now learned that one of the elemental issues upon which the burden of proof paper rests is to ask a reasonable quantification of energy demand by 2050. 100% renewable energy scenarios depend on unrealistic and immoral assumptions when addressing energy demand, particularly for the African continent. It is high time that we stop this ridiculous, dangerous and ignorant nonsense once and for all.